good to see everybody this morning. Come on in and find a seat if you can. <laughs> if there, there might not be, we might have to do the thing where you all scoot to the middle, middle of the aisles and leave some, hopefully the fire marshal won't come and no, it's, it's great to see you all this morning, and a, and a special greeting to, the, to those of you who uh, might not normally be streaming, but you're on today, and of course our prayers are with the, the long list of people who are uh, coming back to us. You know, we did this last year, we were kind of down during this time, and we used Thanksgiving to rally, and then we had a strong... December and a very nice January and February and I think we're on that same trajectory this year and uh, and our, 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 our prayers go out to those who are experiencing some times of weakness right now. We're also thankful for um, those of you who jump into places of responsibility when others are taken out. That includes our worship leaders this morning. You almost had me up here. It just, it was real close, but, but these guys in Jan said, let's take this, and so bless you for, uh, for, for jumping in here and, and helping us. Let's uh, bring the morning to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll sing together and, and go on with our service. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for the Thanksgiving season where we have so many things to thank you for. That includes material things like food for yet another year, um, like um, health that you've given us or that you are bringing, giving back to us. Uh, we are dependent on you for all these things um, and, uh, and, and most of all for Jesus. We have everything we need in him as we'll see in the message today and we thank you. We pray for those who are missing today and we pray for those who are missing because they're hunting today as well, and we would uh, pray success for them. May they enjoy their time in your world and with others, and would you also bring them back to us uh, as well very soon. And, uh, and we thank you for this day. We thank you for everything that we get to celebrate in Jesus and be thankful for. Amen. And, uh... John and I are, are going to be uh, singing out of the hymnal, and uh, to many of you, these will be familiar. If they're not, maybe on the second verse, it'll be familiar. And we'll have the words up here, of course. So we sound better when we stand, when we sing. So please stand, if you would, and join us. And um, come Christians, join to sing. Yeah. 
That was wonderful. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. Uh, welcome to Woodland Community Church. Uh, I've got just, uh, just a few announcements here. I, I think I could make a game show out of this of what, what's happening and what's not happening with how things change all the time. Um, I feel sorry for parents out there trying to patch together, okay, what's happening this week when everything seems to change all the time. But high school youth group is happening tonight, but it won't happen next week, okay? So high school, we're gathering tonight. Uh, this Wednesday, there is no middle school youth group and no true seekers. And then today, um, for education hour, we're not gathering. But next week, there will be an adult class, but not children or youth next week. So try to put that together. It'll make sense eventually. Um, and that's just what's going on with our, our children, our youth, our adult classes. Um, and for small groups, I'm sure every group has made a different decision about this week as well. So uh, that is what's going on in our church news. Um, and I'm going to invite Brad Eitzen to come forward and share um, something that the missions team would like to share with the congregation about. Thanks. Yeah, isn't it great to be up here? Yeah, thankfulness. Uh, yeah, that, couldn't say that about three weeks ago. So, yeah, so God is good. Um, as a missions team, we just like to encourage you guys and just a couple things. Um, this month, as you get together with friends and family and neighbors, uh, the first thing is to be thankful. To be generally thankful and to reflect on the many ways that God has cared for you and for what he's done over the last over the last year as you get together as a family and most of all, you see the big picture of what God has done through Jesus for all of us. And sometimes we forget that big picture and we're thinking about the little things, but there's so much to be grateful for in Jesus that we have. And then secondly, out of that joyfulness, we get the opportunity to share and be, I would say, be missional in the things that we do uh, with neighbors and friends and to share all that Jesus has done for me. Because sometimes the focus is, man, Jesus did this. I just didn't do this, but Jesus has done these things. And just to be um, more missional in that particular way as you have opportunity to be with families and friends and people around you. And then finally, the last reminder on your seats, there are envelopes there. If you um, would like to be able to be a part of this opportunity to give to our missionaries, there's 11 different families that we uh, support, and uh, we try to raise about $100 or more if we would like to each year. We have up to 400 right now, and so thank you so much for that. So as God lays on your heart, that would be a, a great opportunity to give, give back to them and just to say thank you as a gift. We're hoping to send that out here in the first or second week of December. So as you pray as a family, think, what can I do? How can I be a part of that? Uh, that's another great opportunity. Thanks, Michael. Is going to pray now. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for another morning that we get to praise your name, Lord, that we get to come before you with thankful hearts, Lord, that it's in you that we have all things, that we have salvation, and Lord, that we find blessings uh, uh, innumerable, Lord, that uh, in the heavenlies we have all that we need for this life and the next, Lord. And uh, as, we, as we reflect on, on you, on what it means to follow you, Lord, um, fill our hearts with joy, with thankfulness, Lord. We are uh, just, just have everything in you. So, uh, Lord, we, we do continue to raise up uh, people that we know in our families, in our neighborhoods that are, are sick with, with COVID and other um, illnesses, Lord. Um, just pray that you would comfort them, be by their side, Lord. Give them strength and help them to recover so that they can uh, join us again and, and, and find great joy in, in being with those that they love, Lord. Uh, we do also think of the hunters who are out in the woods even this morning and throughout this week, Lord. We pray for safety and protection over them, Lord. Uh, may they be aware of their surroundings and, and Lord, bring them back to their homes um, whole, Lord. And uh, just pray, just protection over those who are out today. Um, Lord, we, we, and we pray for this week as we go out to different families and gather together and celebrate uh, just all the things that we can be thankful about, Lord. Um, may we be a light into our families, Lord. A lot of our, the people that we know that we'll be gathering 
um, don't know you, Lord, and yet uh, this, this time of year is a great time to share the hope that we have, share the, why we are so thankful, and, and why no matter what this world looks like, uh, we can have joy and we can have peace because you are victorious, you are on the throne, and, uh, and we are um, abiding in you, Lord. And so I just pray for just everyone here this morning, Lord, that you would uh, just give them a vision for how they can interact and witness and share their, lo- their uh, love for you with, with those around them this week, Lord. And so uh, this morning I ask that you'd bless it, speak to our hearts, may we come humbly before your feet, Lord, and help us to find great joy in, in, in you, Lord, our friend, our savior, our guide, and, uh, and our light, Lord. So we are so thankful for you. Um, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now we'd invite you to uh, join with us again and, and sing it out in full voice. Uh, some rather traditional uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving hymns. And uh, so we invite you to stand and sing with us. next song, I have to say this. When I was a kid, we had uh, like a 78 record of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. And I listened to it over and over and over again. And anyway, so it may be new to those of you who are under like 50, but uh, try to sing along with us anyways on I Love to Tell the Story.
Yes, I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else could do. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and His love. I love to tell the story, more wonderful it seems, than all the golden fancies of all our golden dreams. I love to tell a story, it did so much for me, and that is just the reason I tell it now to thee. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, it is pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story. salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him more and more Jesus, Jesus seated. All right, I see they've begun to move to the back. This is time for children's church, so any kids that that's right for can head on out the back along with those who care for them. Uh, before we go to the Word this morning, I want to put out a, a, a plea um, Illness has taken out a number of people who care for us. You know, um, there's a lot that goes on here in our church under the surface and behind the scenes. And, uh, and, and many of the people that, that, that 
that, that do the hard work uh, aren't always up here. In fact, most of them aren't. And, uh, and it so happens that this time, um, you know, a number of people have been taken out who often care for us. That is true in our meals ministry, uh, particularly this time. So those who have been sick have been getting meals, and it's a problem when the people who make the meals are the ones who need the meals. See what I'm saying? So um, we're, we're putting out a plea if, if you could make a meal, even, even one meal, and, and do that here in the next couple of weeks, uh, this might be a good time to do that. And uh, I, I tell you what, let's do it this way. If, if, you, if this is you and you would like to produce a meal, why don't you email Leah at woodlandchurch13 at gmail.com. Did I get that right? Woodlandchurch13 at gmail.com. I'm just checking off with Michael. Uh, and that's, that's one word, Woodland Church 13, 13 as in the number 13, not written out, but the number 13, at gmail.com. Just let us know that you can do that. That's the first request. Secondly, um, I would love to decorate for Christmas up here at the front. But here again, same people and the same situation. And I think the way we're going to handle this is that later in this week, perhaps early next week or whenever we get this together, Leah's going to send out an all-church email saying, hey, we're going to put up some decorations for Christmas at church at this particular time. And, and we'll try to organize it that way. And so you can just be watching your email. If you don't get church emails, there's a little connection card, or there usually is, under the chairs on the outside rows, and you can let us know, and we'll get you hooked up that way. Okay, those are, the, those are the requests. Now we're turning to the Lord's Word this morning, and we're going to be in Psalm 91 in particular. And I'd like to do something a little bit different to start things this morning. We are very good at running and doing, are we not? Especially coming into the the Advent season, this is the time we run and do and think and push buttons on the screen and all sorts of stuff. And I'd like us to start this Thanksgiving season by sitting and, and, and letting God's word wash over us. And we're going to do that in the form of watching a, a video um, from poor Bishop Hooper that sends out a psalm every Wednesday. I love this little group, husband-wife team, who have spent um, the COVID era producing a psalm and putting it to music every week and then mailing it out every Wednesday. And they, they hit Psalm 91 about a month ago, and I said, ah, that's where we're going. So let's collect that. Let's just sit for about four and a half minutes and, uh, and let the Lord minister to us in music and with Psalm 91. Of the Almighty 
Let's open our Bibles, if we haven't done so already, to Psalm 91. And then I'd like us to find a a second passage as well. Uh, This is Matthew 4. We'll look at verses 5 and 7. Matthew 4, so maybe you can find Matthew 4 and shove a piece of paper back there. Or if you're doing it on a phone... Do whatever it takes to do that kind of thing. At least maybe no, we're just going there. I read a startling article this week. and I couldn't believe it when I read it, so I had to read some other articles behind it just to make sure it was true, and they all said the same thing. We got the CDC numbers this week on opioid overdoses and the deaths that have taken place as a result of these drug overdoses, um, 100,000, 102,000 people between April of 2020 and May of 2021 have died of opioid Overdose. So some of these drugs are legal, some aren't, or at least to have them. Some of these people are sick, some of them aren't. But just to, uh, to put that into perspective, that's a 30% over increase over the previous year. And it makes uh, opioid, death by opioid overdose the seventh leading cause of death in our country. And to put that into perspective, COVID is the third leading cause of death within that same time period. So something like 345,000 people have died of COVID, but 102,000 people. So that's, that means that for every three people who have died of COVID, there's another person who may not even be sick who has died of opioid overdose. That, that sounds like a public health emergency to me. That sounds like a spiritual epidemic to me. And, and, and what it shows us is that people are very lonely. People are very afraid. People are, are looking for refuge in something. 
People have lost track of ultimate reality. People are needing the presence of the Lord. And that's what Psalm 91 is about. It is a, it is a great thanksgiving psalm that is about dwelling in the presence of the Lord despite fear, isolation, and loneliness. And we'll see from this psalm, as well as from all of Scripture, that the, the presence of the Lord brings life and real safety and thanksgiving and joy. We don't know where Psalm 91 comes from exactly. Um, many scholars believe that it's from the Babylonian captivity period. So remember how that works. The two southern tribes um, beginning in 586 BC um, went into captivity in Babylon. The temple has been destroyed. With it, their place of meeting with God. And now the captor nation, Babylon, has begun to collapse. So we sometimes say the writing is on the wall. Well, in this case, the writing really was on the wall. Um, society is beginning to fall about, apart. And, and Israel is seeking the presence of the Lord and finding him while yet encountering fear and isolation and loneliness. That's the, the context as best as we can put it together for Psalm 91. I'd like to read through it, and then we'll, we'll talk through it together, and then we'll talk especially about how to think about this idea today in light of Jesus and, and, and who he is. So this is Psalm 91. Let's, we've already heard it. That was beautiful. Now let's read it right out of the Bible. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For who will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence? For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked." Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample, trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. As we look through this psalm, We're going to see that it starts with a principle regarding the presence of the Lord. And then we move on through to some possible threats to the presence of the Lord. Then provision for the presence of the Lord. And finally, the Lord's promise for his presence, the presence of the Lord. So we get the principle Right up front here, verses 1 and 2. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. These are fantastic images, aren't they? The shelter of the Lord, the shadow of the Almighty. In other words, if you cling to God, you'll have the benefits of His protection. Notice here where the presence of the Lord is. For Israel, it used to be in the temple. That's where they went to 
meet with the Lord. But now when the temple is gone, where do you find the Lord's presence? Well, you can still come to him. He is not, he is not bound by buildings, though that idea was kind of unusual to them. Notice how God is addressed here. Elyon, Most High, Shaddai, the Almighty, Adonai, that mysterious word that, that looks like Yahweh and is pronounced Adonai, and in English we write it Lord, usually with four capital letters. This is God's covenant-keeping name. He keeps his promises to his people, and we think about that every time we see the word Lord in the Old Testament. Notice what the Lord is compared to. He's a shelter. This is a word that can mean hiding place or secret place. We know a lot of verses with this word in it. Psalm 27, for he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high up on a rock and then even more famously, Psalm 139, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. That's the same word. God is a, is a shelter. He hides us. He's a hiding place. He's also a shadow caster. All right, that's a good thing. When, when trouble comes, you want something that is big and strong enough to cast a shadow, right? Right? You can hide in the shadow of the Lord. He's a refuge and a fortress. And when armies are looking for you, you better have a refuge and a fortress that is strong enough to deter. And the Lord is. The commentator Alan Ross writes, A hiding place is important, but it's the presence of the Lord that protects. You don't need a building to be protected you need the very presence of the lord that's the principle then we come verses three to eight to possible threats to the presence of the lord these are listed generally in pairs and there are some word images that are mixed in here the first pair is involves man-made attacks all right you'll be protected from the snare of the fowler now this is confusing for us because most of us don't hunt birds with hawks here. Some people might hunt birds. But right now, people are out. They have food plots. They have tree stands. They're doing drives. So you have to imagine you're the deer here. Right? You're protected from these people. Of course, we're hunters. We want the animals. But imagine you're a deer. You're protected. You're protected from the deadly pestilence. Something interesting is going on here. In the original, in the Masoretic text tradition, you don't get vowels. You just get consonants. And sometimes we look at that and we're not sure which vowels to put in because the consonants could spell out a couple of different words. So my translation says deadly pestilence. It's also possible to have the expression devouring word. That would make sense. I like that because it means that both of these together indicate man-made threats. You're, you're, you're protected from the trap that somebody lays for you as well as the word that someone might speak to destroy you. It's not a big issue, but uh, it's, in, it's true. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find ref refuge. This is the mother chick. Mother chick. The mother hen. <laughs> we do have chickens. They don't lay eggs anymore, but we have chickens. This is the mother hen protecting the chicks, and then the, the shield, the buckler, the, the, the armor. Then you get the next pair. Surprise attack versus open, versus open assaults. He'll protect you from the terror of the night. So this is the sneak attack as well as the arrows that fly by day. See how this poetry works? It's like thought rhyming. You know, the nighttime versus the day, the secret versus the open attack. Then you have surprise illnesses versus unsurprising illnesses. The pestilence that stalks in darkness. 
the times when you go to sleep and you wake up sick and you don't even know where the virus came from, or destruction that wastes away at noonday, the pandemic that you hear about on the news and it's coming, and nobody is super surprised by it. The last pair of images is is more complex. Military collapse plus the judgment of the wicked. In, In the time of Israel, if your armies fell, it's because God wasn't protecting you. It's because you had done something as a nation and God had had pulled back his protection from you. But we're also told here that if you're in the presence of the Lord, that might happen, but when judgment happens, you won't be touched because you are righteous. You're only going to look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. All these are different threats to the presence of the Lord, but for those who take refuge in the presence of the Lord, you're protected, possible threats. Then you have provision, verses 9 to 13. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. What does God provide? Well, he provides angelic protection. He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot on a stone. That's the first provision. Second provision is ultimate victory. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample under foot. This is language that reminds me of Isaiah 11. Remember the little child who's going to lead the the dangerous animal and how people can stick their hands down there and touch the snake and the snake's not going to bite them. This is messianic kingdom language involving the new creation. So that's God's provision. Finally, we have promises. Last three verses. Get three promises here. The Lord's going to deliver believers. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. You know who God is. You know who to call on. Second promise, the Lord answers prayers. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. And then the third promise, the Lord gives long life. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's a beautiful psalm of thanksgiving. We read this, we take it down into our hearts, we thank the Lord for who he is. If you are reading well right now, you're asking a question. Is this true? We got to ask, we can ask these questions. It's God's word, we give thanks to the Lord, we say, is this true? Or maybe even a better question, in what sense is this true? So if I embrace the presence of the Lord, and we know he is is there in Jesus, and anyone can come to him, if we embrace the presence of the Lord, will my thanksgiving plans hold together? We're all kind of wondering that. We're all hoping we get to do whatever we want to do. Will I get the job I want? Will I get the house I want? Will I get to stay out of quarantine and play sports? That's a real thing. Will I be safe from COVID? If this is true. And it is. But how is this true? If you would, let's turn to that second passage. This is Matthew 4. Verses 5 and 7, which involves the Lord Jesus. And he's going to help us see how this is true. You know, the Bible is literally God's word. Everything we read is a revelation of God's will. There's nothing in his word that's not there that he, that's, that he doesn't want to be there. 
The Bible is literally God's word, but not everything in the Bible is to be read lit- literally. We need to read God's word through the lens of the gospel, which is everything that God has accomplished through Jesus. And we're going to see an illustration of how that works in this passage. So Matthew 4 is largely about the temptation. So Jesus, you know, you know the story, Jesus is being tempted. Adam and Eve fell. They were imperfect followers of God's law. Jesus is going to prove to be the perfect follower of God's law. And to prove that, he fasts for 40 days. So he's very hungry. All right? And he is, don't miss this, he's in the presence of the Lord for 40 days. Is God enough? Yes. Is Jesus going to prove that? Yes. But Jesus is going to prove that not at his highest point when he's had three square meals and he feels great. He's going to prove that at the weakest time of his life, excluding the cross, of course. And Satan, after 40 days, 40 nights, Jesus is dying, okay? 40 days, no food, you're dying. Satan, Satan comes to him, and I believe this really happened, okay? It's not just a story. And there's the three temptations. And here we have the middle temptation in verses 5, 6, and 7. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, here we go, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. There it is, Psalm 91. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And of course Jesus goes on and he passes the tests. Notice that Satan wants Jesus to interpret Psalm 91 literally. Watch out when Satan quotes scripture because he'll often quote it right, but he'll emphasize the wrong thing. Watch out. He says, Jesus, do whatever you want to do. You don't have to carry out the Father's will. You're protected, says here, right here in Psalm 91. Oh, and Oh, and if you are righteous and something bad does happen to you, like the crucifixion, then maybe God isn't who he says he is. Or maybe God isn't true to his word. Or maybe God doesn't have your best interest in mind. Where have you heard that before? The garden, right? The temptation is really just a recasting of the garden. To Eve in the garden, Satan said, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God really doesn't have your best interest in mind. He isn't all that he says that he is. He's not really going to protect you. Remember what Satan wants. He wants God's image bearers to question God's character. He wants us to read Psalm 91 and say, oh, God's not all that. He's really not going to protect me. I can't really trust in God. That's what he wants, and that's what he does to Jesus. Above all, Satan wanted in this passage, too late for him now, but he wants to keep Jesus from going to the cross. That's what he wants. He's he's willing to acknowledge who Jesus is and even play second fiddle to him if only he can keep Jesus from going to the cross, because it's at the cross that Jesus accomplishes the plan of redemption. Can't let that happen. And so he, he tempts him with a false reading of Psalm 91. Notice how Jesus responds. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. 
In other words, the Father has a plan that is for my ultimate good and is for the ultimate good of all of God's people. It's about redemption, which is about the buying back of people from sin and death, the buying back of his image bearers. Remember what Jesus said in the garden. He hasn't said it yet in the passage. He will say it. In the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is going to say, right before his crucifixion, do not think that I cannot appeal to my Father, and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. Think Psalm 91. But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it, that's the work of redemption, must be so? And so after Jesus answers Satan, Jesus just, he doesn't even mess with Satan's false reasoning. He just responds with more scripture and appeals to everything that God is doing, big picture. After Jesus does that, he lives a perfect life, and then what does he do? He goes to the cross, and he takes fallen creation on himself, including our viruses, our pestilences, our natural disasters. He takes our moral and spiritual rebellion on himself. He takes death on himself, and he drinks it all up. And what does the Father do? He accepts Jesus' work of redemption. He raises Jesus from the dead. And he creates a way to dwell in his presence that is entered into through Jesus. And Jesus secures that audience with the Father. So everything in Psalm 91 is true through the lens of the gospel, and because of Jesus. Amen? It's true. Psalm 91, though, doesn't teach that, things won't, that bad things won't happen to us. That wasn't even true for Jesus. What Psalm 91 teaches is that nothing will take us out of the presence of the Lord, which has been secured by Jesus. And then, and then this idea is pressed all the way through Scripture. You get to Romans 8, 28, where, 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 where nothing can take us out of the presence of God because of the work that is accomplished through Jesus. And then at the fullness of God's plan of redemption, when Jesus comes back, all these bad things that have been defeated by Jesus at the cross and at the tomb, they're removed entirely. So th this is an example, Psalm 91 is an example of how to read in the context of the fullness of God's revelation and everything that we see in Christ. If you're an Israelite reading this, you gotta look forward to Messiah. And, and believe that Messiah is coming, and then when Jesus comes, it all makes sense. See how everything in the Bible makes sense through the lens of the gospel and through Jesus. It's a hard exercise, isn't it? To read the part in light of the whole. So here we are at Thanksgiving, and we're alone. You read Psalm 91, and you're like, well, you know, Ah, it's true. I believe this in Jesus, but I'm, I'm alone. You know what you can do? You can be thankful for the presence of the Lord. I might feel alone during the holidays, but oh, I'm in the presence of the Lord, which has been won for me by the Lord Jesus, and you're encouraged. Maybe you're sick at Thanksgiving, and you, you read this passage, and you say, praise God that ultimate healing is mine in Jesus. And if you are sick, we pray a little bit of that ultimate healing now that you would come back to us soon. Maybe you're scared. You can place your trust in Jesus knowing that he is your refuge. He is your strong place. He is the secret place where you can go to be protected. 
this Thanksgiving, we can take refuge in the Lord, knowing that the presence of the Lord has been secured for us by Jesus for all who trust in him. And that, that last part is really important because you read Psalm 91, you read, you read Matthew 4, uh, and you think about Thanksgiving. It's a national holiday. We're all thankful. People who don't trust in Jesus can be thankful. There's a lot of things to be thankful for. But ultimately, Psalm 91 is not about, it's not a brotherhood of man kind of passage. It's not like anybody can read this and say, oh, I'm good. I got the presence of the Lord. No, you don't. Not unless you're trusting in Jesus. Psalm 91 pushes us forward to Messiah, whom we learn to be the Lord Jesus himself. So if you're, if you're reading this and you really are scared and some of these ideas are all new and you're like, well, I'm not sure I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm not sure I'm in the presence of the Lord. The Lord himself would simply invite us to acknowledge our sin, that we've run from him. And to confess that sin to him, say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I have run from you. But then trust Jesus. And it's in Jesus that we have salvation, that we have security, and you know what else happens? The passage, neither one of these passages talk about this, but it's true. We see it in the rest of Scripture. When we trust in Jesus, His Spirit enters into our lives, and His Spirit unlocks the rest of Scripture. So we, suddenly, we're reading the whole Bible with Jesus in mind. We're even reading hard passages like Psalm 91 and saying, how is this true? And we see we see that it's true through Jesus. He helps explain it. And, and, and then we're able to see how the whole Bible relates to our lives. All of it's true in Jesus, who gives us our entry point to the presence of the Lord, who is our, our security, who is our secret place, who is our strong tower. Throw whatever image you want in there. That's why this is a wonderful Thanksgiving passage. It's all true in Jesus. So this week, let's be thankful for everything we have in our country. And then let's be thankful in Jesus because Jesus is enough. Father, thank you for this beautiful psalm that is, is true because of, of your work of redemption in Jesus. Thank you for helping us. And we do thank you for this season. We thank you for all that we have in you and then all that you have blessed us with in our country, your provision for yet another year, your provision of your presence that is going to take us into next year that we don't even know about. Help us, Lord, uh, to remember that we are in your presence. And when we're afraid... When we feel isolated, when we're fearful, when we think we're alone, help us to go back and glory in all the truths of this passage and remember that they're, they're true because of you, Jesus. Thank you so much. We pray it in your name. Amen. Now, from Psalm 91, under his wings, um, we can take refuge. Um, birds' wings and feathers are really amazing things. Obviously, the really amazing thing is for most of them, most birds, it enables them to fly. But also, they provide warmth and waterproofing. And uh, anyway, they're just kind of amazing things if you take a close look at them. But we'd invite you to stand and sing with us uh, this uh, old hymn, Under His Wings. safely abiding though the night deepens and tempests are wild still I can trust him I know he will keep me he has redeemed me and I am his child under his wings under his wings 
traveling this week do it well and come back and then we'll celebrate we'll begin to celebrate the advent season together when you return so we're dismissed have a great week in the lord we'll see you soon